Well, good evening. Uh, it's a joy to be with you all uh, tonight, and uh, I, I love the topic we're going to be looking at, stewardship. Um, the Bible is crammed full of, uh, of this principle of stewardship, and there's a lot we can learn together tonight, but let's invite the Lord to come alongside of us and lead us in this discussion tonight. So, hey, God, I am so thankful for your presence with each and every one of us. It is amazing to think as stretched out as we are around the western states, you are right there present with each and every one of us. And holy God, how I invite you to, to lead this topic tonight. Help us to learn those principles that will allow us to better serve you in the day, the time, and the place in which we live. I praise you, I thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we are going to be talking about stewardship. It's one of the most dominant themes in the entire Bible, from the very, very beginning all the way through the end. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 say this, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. The real issue of stewardship is whether you and I are administering, uh, administering our own affairs and our own possessions as if they were ours or are we doing it as if they really belong to God? Our lives uh, are shaped by the decisions we make, and the greatest of these decisions is this. Am I the Lord of my life, or is my Heavenly Father the Lord of my life? We're either going to seek um, to rule our own lives, the tragedy of the first Adam, or... We're going to submit to the rule of our Heavenly Father, which was the triumph of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. This is the difference between the great I will that we find in Isaiah chapter 14, spoken by Satan, versus the great thy will that was spoken by Jesus Christ in Matthew 6 and Mark 14. Whether we realize it or not, we face this decision Will I do it God's way, or will I do it my way? Will I call my own shots, or will I submit to God's shots when it comes to my time, my possessions, my abilities? We do that every single day of our lives. Most of the time, we're not even thinking about it. So let's begin with a good definition. What's a good definition of, of stewardship? Oh, boy. My slide is suddenly not advancing. Um, and the, the New Testament Greek word translated stewardship is oikonomia, from which we get our word economy. It literally means management of a household, and it refers to the responsibility that is entrusted to a manager. A steward acts as the administrator of the affairs and possessions of another. In our case, God. The uh, Disciple Study Bible defines stewardship as a way of living that involves one's daily activities, values, and goals for life, and the use of all possessions. It begins with God and his plans for creation and purposes for humankind. The steward is God's responsible representative and manager of all creation. This kind of stewardship uh, requires a fundamental commitment to present ourselves completely to God and his, as his servants with, with no reservations. Now, the return on this whole life stewardship is you and I will be filled with, with joy and fulfillment and contentment that we'll never be able 
able to achieve when we live as those who own it all. Uh, well, you might be saying, hey, this is great, Steve, but what does practical stewardship really look like in my life? What does it uh, look like to view everything I do as though I'm a manager of God's stuff? Well, we want to look at four uh, different major principles of stewardship. In these four principles, you and I will discover how uh, to order our lives in a way that aligns us with God's will as revealed in the scripture and will create in our own hearts a completeness, a fulfillment that we'll never achieve without learning this, these principles. Now, I'm having a real issue, Chris. This was working until, let me try this one and see. There we go, stewardship. The four principles we want to look at. Number one, the principle of ownership. Ownership. By the way, this one principle of ownership, it's the foundation for all the others. If you and I fail to grasp and implement this principle in our lives, the others are a waste of time. Then there's the principle of responsibility, the principle of accountability, and finally, the principle of rewards. First of all, then, the principle of ownership. Psalm 24, verse 1 says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Hey, how much does God own? Well, <laughs> he owns it all. Um, there's a fundamental truth, a foundational truth, that we find throughout Scripture and that you and I must embrace. We must build our lives on. And it's right there in front of you. God is the owner. I am his manager. God is the owner. I'm just the manager. I don't care if we have to repeat this to ourselves 20 times a day. God is the owner. I'm just the manager. The sooner that sinks into the soil of our heart and becomes the mandate by which we live, the more free we're going to be to accomplish God's will in our lives. In the Bible, we find several instances, repeated instances, where the followers of God um, decided they wanted to be the owner as opposed to being the manager. And in each case, uh, the effects of that sin have been absolutely devastating. I want to look at three examples. First of all, it's the first couple. You know, have you ever asked yourself, as I have, I'm a preacher's kid, so when my dad was up there preaching, and we didn't have children's church in my day, so, you know, my mind tended to wander, and, and I remember it wandering around, what in the world was wrong with eating a piece of fruit? I mean, in the home I grew up in, my mom was constantly trying to get me to eat fruit. Adam and Eve ate fruit, and they got a whammy. Why? I mean, it could have been... In my mind, it was like this. Why was it the forbidden fruit? Why wasn't it the forbidden liquor? Or why wasn't it the forbidden drug? Or why wasn't it the forbidden woman? The forbidden fruit? But think about it, if you will, with me for a moment. God placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right in the middle of the garden. He told Adam and Eve they could... Eat any, they could go anywhere they wanted in that garden. They could eat anything they wanted in that garden. They could do whatever they wanted in that garden. There was only one prohibition. There was one restriction. Do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet they ate it. Why did God put that there? I'm convinced it was because that was his reminder to the first couple. I own the garden. I want you to manage my garden. I own it. You manage it. And Adam and Eve, what was the temptation that Satan, Lucifer, threw at Eve? God knows if you eat of this, you'll be just like God. You'll be able to rule your own lives. You'll be able to determine your own destiny. God just wants to enslave you. Let me set you free. Well, 
as I like to ask people all the time, how's that been working out for us? You see, the sin of the very the very first sin ever created committed by mankind was a sin against God's ownership, as opposed to being managers. How about the first brothers? Now, I was lied to in Sunday school, and I bet you were too. How do I know I was lied to? Because my Sunday school teachers used to tell me the reason that God would not accept Cain's offering was because it was bloodless. You know, Abel brought this lamb and he slaughtered it and there was blood and, and Cain had the audacity to, to bring a grain offering and there was no blood and man, they would just wax elephant about that, uh, eloquent about that, wax elephants. But anyway, the first, that wasn't true. As I read the Bible as I got older, I, I discovered in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 10, I think chapter 2 as well, God made provision for grain offerings. That wasn't the sin. Let's take a little closer look at that scripture in, uh, in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. It says this, Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. That's verses 2 through 5 of uh, Genesis 4. You see, Cain brought some of the fruit, whereas Abel brought the first fruit. He brought the very first part. But Cain just brought some of. May I say this? God doesn't want our leftovers. God wants the first cut of the meat. He wants the first slice of the pie. He wants the first row of the garden. It, it belongs to him. Why does he want that? Because he's mean? Because he wants to uh, demean us? No. Because he wants to constantly remind us that all good things come from him. And if we'll just let him be the owner and we do our best to manage it for him, we're going to find our needs are being met. Our lives are being directed. And we're experiencing him as we never would if we tried to own it all. How about the first city? You know, it's pretty interesting to me. It was There's only one city that God put these kind of restrictions on the children of Israel. But when uh, General Joshua uh, had his people assembled and they were going to go into Jericho, God gave them a plan on how to take that city. And with it, he gave uh, this instruction. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her house shall be spared because she had the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble upon it. All the silver, all the gold, all the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Joshua 6, 17 through 19. Why did God demand all of the plunder, all of the spoils of Jericho? It never happens again. It was only this city. Well, because after they crossed the River Jordan, this was the first city Israel came to. God was about to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. He wanted to remind them right from the get-go, give me all the spoils of this first city because I'm the owner, you're just the managers. 
And if you're going to manage this new land I'm giving you well, you need to be reminded. I know you. I created you. I watched you fall. You must have this principle of ownership down or you will not obey me in the future. The principle of ownership. The first city. God is the owner. You and I are just the managers. You know, that didn't happen. We all know how Achan took some of the spoils and he hit him in the floor of his tent. He thought he got away with it. And then Israel went to that next little town of Ai and they got whooped. And all of Israel, starting with Joshua on down, God, what have you done? Why have you abandoned us? And as the story goes, Achan, all of his family, all of his servants, all of his animals, all of his possessions, all the animals and the people were put to death, and uh, they were burned. The body, what was left was just was burnt. Nothing was left. You know, as I read that, I don't think I want to disobey God when it comes to this very important principle of ownership. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 7, verse 17 says something that we might be tempted to think. It says this, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But Deuter Deuteronomy 8, 18, the very next verse says this, it says, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It's not mine. It's his. Once again, he's the owner. I'm just the manager. He's the owner. You are just the manager. So that's the principle of ownership. Let's move on to that next principle. And that's the principle of responsibility. The principle of responsibility. God gives us all things richly to enjoy, but nothing is ours. Uh, nothing really belongs to us. God owns it all. You know, you and I are really, as human beings, we really get hung up on, well, what are my rights? Especially Americans, because we have our rights and we like to flaunt them. And yet, the, the question we need to be asking is not what are my rights. Owners have rights. We're managers. We're stewards. We have responsibilities. And the Bible is good to us because it is clear as it gives us the responsibilities that we have as God's managers. Because of that, we should take very seriously Paul's words that are uh, recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. It says this, Now it is required of servant managers that each one should prove to be trustworthy. Now, can God trust me to manage his stuff? It's the character of my heart that's going to determine how well I can do that. So let's look at some of the character traits of, uh, of a trustworthy manager. First of all, there's faithfulness. Uh, the broadest responsibility of a manager uh, is that of faithfulness. We just read 1 Corinthians 4.2. God tests our faithfulness in little things before he places us in charge of larger things. We're told that in Matthew chapter 25. Our faithfulness in managing what God has entrusted to us is a determinative factor in the responsibilities and rewards, not only of our earthly management, but of that which we will be entrusted in eternity. Think about that. This is our proving ground. I need to look in the mirror, and so do you, each day and say, God, how well am I managing your stuff? Because the better I manage today, the more he'll entrust me to manage tomorrow and even into eternity. Faithfulness in our management is a very major, major thing. 
Secondly, the character trait that uh, is important is also that of diligence. God wants us to work hard for our living so that we'll be able to provide for our own good and for those of others. Now, God wants me to provide for Steve. He wants me to provide for my wife, my children, but he also wants me to provide for others in need. And to do that, I'm going to have to work hard. And the Bible is just full of passages about that. We need to be diligent in our work. We cannot be marked by slothfulness or procrastination. We cannot be like those who just sit around waiting and waiting. Uh, we need to be ready to take opportunities that God brings into our lives and, and, to, uh, and to maximize those opportunities for him and for others. A third very important um, character trait is that of integrity. As Christians, our work and our financial policies must be examples of integrity and honesty. Well, I just hate it when I come across uh, stories or, or reports or sometimes watching the news of, of people in ministry who have been uh, co who've compromised their faith and have gotten taken up in shady dealings and, uh, and all of a sudden they're going off to jail. I remember a pastor up in the Wenatchee, Washington area years and years ago now, and he and his wife were able to get on a plane just before the federales basically showed up at the church building and arrested his chief financial officer. They had been skimming offerings for years, he and that other gentleman, and they'd been investing them in offshore accounts. And uh, it, it was su such a hideous thing because that, that town was, isn't huge. And, and, and the shame, it was just almost unbearable to be a Christ follower during the next several months. Every news report and, and every newspaper article, one shot after another against the name of the Lord. Because this man, these two men, had done something hideous. And the lives were destroyed because of it. Integrity is so important. Dishonesty reveals a lack of real dependence upon God's ability to provide. If I really believe God can meet my need according to his riches and glory, why would I do why would I do something like stealing? Why why would I manipulate people to give that which they're not prepared to give? I remember a pastor bragging to me one time. I was in Bible college, and he said, yeah, when I want a new pair of shoes, and I'm, out, uh, and I'm uh, sitting up, this is the old days where the, all the staff would sit up above, and it was a large church, and, and he'd sit up there in one of those pulpit pews up there, and, and he'd cross his legs, and he'd always wear a pair of shoes that had a hole in it. And he goes, 95% of the time when I wear a pair of shoes like that, I get a, I get a card in the next week with money to buy a new pair of shoes. And he was bragging. And I was just going, I was gagging. There's no room for that in the kingdom of God. The Lord will not bless what we gain through dishonesty or get, get rich schemes. Um, Proverbs 20 says this, bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. Think of that. His mouth will be filled with gravel. Well, as we consider our responsibilities to our Heavenly Father in the area of stewardship, uh, there are several concepts that we need to consider. There's four major perils that we must avoid. The first of those is greed. We must avoid greed. The desire for acquisition is, a deeply, is deeply rooted in the human condition. It's this desire that lures us into materialism and leads us then into idolatry. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9, and 10 says this, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The pursuit of wealth always leads us away from the pursuit of God. You can't serve God and money, Jesus said. Materialism and spiritual complacency go hand in hand. I wonder how many Christians have been neutralized by the cares of this world. Their effectiveness, our effectiveness, totally choked out by the weeds of, of, of want. So the desire for success and recognition can be more devastating to our relationship with Christ than, than, than the pursuit of wealth. Um, you know, let me talk here to those who are going to pursue what we like to call full-time Christian service. I don't like to use that term because every Christian is in full-time Christian service. But for those who are professional in, in, their, in, in their vocation, whether they're missionaries or pastors, worship leaders, whatever, um, let me say this. When you and I enslave ourselves to ministry, we are committing idolatry. I have been a pastor since 1975, and please let me confess, I have been a slave at times to the idolatry of ministry. When the church growing became all-consuming, and, and I remember God putting me on my derriere, he, he had me in three surgeries, or three hospitalizations, two surgeries on five different kinds of antibiotics for six months. And to this day, it took me about two months into that before I realized what God was doing. He was saying, you haven't listened to me till now. I'm going to put you on your behind, Farnworth, and you're going to listen. Be still and know that I am God. And, and, and I'm such a hard head. God didn't say it that way. He said, sit down, shut up, and listen because I had become completely consumed as a pastor in chasing the idol of ministry. And it was during that time my heart swung back to him, and I quit caring how many people were there on Sunday. I was more concerned about how well I communicated God's truth so that they, like me, could humble ourselves confess our sin, and become more like him. God will cause it to grow if he wants it to grow. He wants us to manage his truth. Well, that wasn't even in the notes. That was a free one. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to ministry success at the same time. You just can't. So, the first peril is greed. Second peril is favoritism. Favoritism. This is another danger associated with money and, and the tendency to uh, show partiality towards those who, who can give more. You know, if I'm pastoring a church and I'm aware that certain people are bigger givers than others, the last people I'm going to be tempted not to offend are those people. If I have uh, supporters who are supporting me on a monthly basis from other places in the world, I can be tempted to, uh, to make sure I never do or say anything that might offend them. Because, after all, that's where a lot of my, my income comes from. Am I going to be there for people who support me more and be there for less for those that don't? Well, if I, if I do that, that's the peril of favoritism. And God makes it pretty clear. There's no place for that in my ministry. Um, James calls that kind of partiality sin in James chapter 2, the first 10 verses. Another one that gets in the way of us, man, and this can hit us when we're in ministry, is pride. Pride. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but humility goes before honor. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. 
there's a temptation among the wealthy uh, to have an arrogant spirit and to boast in our possessions. I've known some wealthy Christians who are phenomenally humble people. You'd never know of their wealth. And they just serve the Lord and they invest their money wisely. This is not against uh, this is not a teaching against wealth. This teaching is about how we manage the wealth that God's entrusted to us. I've known wealthy Christians who were super duper managers for Christ. And I've known others that had very little and they were terrible managers because it was about pride. It wasn't about servanthood. We cannot let our pride get in the way. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the fourth caution, the fourth major peril is that of autonomy. This is that ever-present danger that Steve lives with of becoming self-directed, self-sufficient. You know, in the world, self-sufficiency is, is a gold badge of honor. But in the kingdom of God, self-sufficiency is a terrible sin. God doesn't want Steve self-sufficient. He wants me Christ-sufficient. He wants me dependent, interdependent with my Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy is told this by Paul in 1 Timothy 6. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Did you get that? God really wants us to enjoy stuff. Fix your eyes, uh, fix, um, fix our hope, not on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. In other words, guys, we're not supposed to trust the wealth. Or we're supposed to trust the God who supplies the wealth. Well, thinking about wealth and money, what is the value of money? Is there value in money? Well, yes, it can overcome calamity. Um, boy, when there's a breakdown in the car or there's a breakdown in my health or, or, or I wake up like I did a year ago, uh, a year ago, February, my wife and I uh, woke up one morning. I came down into our walkout basement and uh, about 6.30 in the morning, and I found myself standing in over two and a half inches of water. We'd had an epic flood the night before, and uh, we're, we live on a slope, and water had come down and got under the, the, the single-story part of the house in the crawl space and come through the back wall of the basement, and it just flooded. They pumped thousands of gallons of water out of this basement. Fortunately, we had been setting aside money faithfully uh, for in case something like that were to happen, and I praise God we had it because it, it that, that, that account got blown apart by something we had not budgeted for. And that's one of the nice things about having some money. It can overcome calamity. Um, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. So it, money can overcome calamity. Number two, it can be a blessing from the Lord, which provides greater enjoyment of the physical aspects of life, and it can improve one's social life. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. Many curry favor with a ruler, and everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts. The poor are shunned by all their relatives. How much more do their friends avoid them? Though the poor pursue them with pleading, they are nowhere to be found. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 4, and verses 6 and 7. But you know what? Let me hasten to say money has its inherent limitations. I came across this quote 
years ago. I don't remember where I even got it, but here's what it said. Money will buy a bed, but not sleep. Books, but not brains. Food, but not an appetite. A house, but not a home. Medicine, but not health. Luxuries, but not culture. Amusement, but not happiness. A crucifix, but not a savior. Money has its value, it has its place, but it has limitations. Well, what about the, we saw the value of money, how about the limitations of money? Number one, money cannot buy genuine happiness and joy. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Proverbs 15, 16 through 18. I think I have time for a quick story. Years ago, my mom and dad took a year out of ministry, and they took their little trailer back to uh, Florida, and they lived in a, near Miami and attended a church where one of my dad's best friends was the pastor. And um, mom and dad painted houses. My dad was a former carpenter, and uh, they painted somebody's condo down on the beachfront, and it was a high-end property. And before you knew it, uh, they were as busy as they wanted to be. They were making great money. One of those beachfront condos was gorgeous. I mean, it was several thousand square feet. It was a little tiny thing. It was owned by a, a wealthy doctor and his wife. Uh, he no longer practiced medicine because he had uh, made some amazing investments. And in fact, this couple owns seven properties around the world, all of them high-end properties. And as my mom and dad were painting, the wife was there, but her husband was living in their um, high-rise in, in uh, Manhattan, and she's living in Miami. And she began to open up and share with my mom how deeply unhappy they were as a couple. This woman had left her career and become pretty much an alcoholic. And uh, as God would have it, my mom was able to share her faith with this woman, and this woman uh, made a profession of faith, and when her husband came home for one weekend, um, he agreed to have mom and dad come over for dinner. So here are these two incredibly wealthy people having dinner with my parents who, uh, who could barely rub two nickels together. They made more money that year, I think, than they ever did in ministry. And... Uh, and so this gentleman agreed that he would try to do marriage counseling. And, and <laughs> the first time they met together, he got so angry with his wife, it turned into a brawl, that he took his glasses off and he threw them against the wall and shattered them. And he pulled out his false teeth and started jumping up and down on them and crushed them. And he told his wife she could basically spend eternity in a rather hot place, grabbed his briefcase, his suitcase, got called a cab and, and went to the airport and, and flew home. And, and my mom and dad just looked at each other. And, and every time I think of this passage, I think of this couple. Because it says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. You see, money cannot buy happiness. It can't buy joy. Money can provide no satisfaction for our spiritual needs. It cannot purchase peace or love or righteousness. Better is a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. Proverbs 17.1. Now that was written by the wealthiest man that ever lived. Evidently, sometimes things weren't too good at the Solomon household. It doesn't last, money doesn't. It slips through our fingers. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings, like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Proverbs chapter 23. It just doesn't last. It slips through our fingers, and it's so fleeting. 
we ultimately leave everything we call ours here on this planet. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. We're going to leave it all behind, folks. The only thing that's going to be waiting for us is that which we've wisely invested in his kingdom. And thinking of that, here's four biblical reminders when it comes to our wealth. Seek first his kingdom. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Luke 12, 15. We cannot combine devotion to earthly goods with loyalty to Christ. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Number one, seek first his kingdom. Number two, serve God, not money. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Luke chapter 16. Haddon Robinson put the issue in these terms. Either we serve God and use money, or we serve money and use God. Yet few Christians deliberately dedicate their lives to materialism. Wealth is deceitful. Jesus told us. And its bondage is subtle. Like the flypaper and the fly, the fly lands on the sticky substance thinking, my flypaper, only to discover that the flypaper was saying, my fly. Our wealth depends not so much on what we have, but on what we can do without. Isn't that interesting? It depends not so much on what we have, but what we can live without. We can cling so hard to our possessions that they won't let us go. Uh, you know, one of the qualifications in the Bible, in the New Testament, for both elders and deacons is that they flee from the love of money and that they're not fond of sordid gain. God wants us um, to love people and to use things. Too often, we love things and we use people. We don't want to be that way. The third, the third thing we must do is we must pursue the things that last. Uh, material wealth is transitory. Uh, biblical wisdom tells us to use our earthly time to build heavenly treasures. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. That's Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6. The world's passing away, and also it's lust, John tells us in 1 John. It's foolish to spend our lives chasing after material things that are, that are, that are being destroyed. Why, why then do so many of us get wrapped up in the pursuit? John White in his book, The Golden Cow, gives this answer. It is want of faith that makes us opt for earthly rather than heavenly treasure. If we really believed in celestial treasures, who among us would be so stupid as to, to buy gold? We just do not believe. Heaven is a dream a religious fantasy which we affirm because we are orthodox. If people believed in heaven, they would spend their time preparing for permanent residence there. But nobody does. That's pretty strong words. You see, the true yardstick of success is not worldly possessions or position, but faithful servanthood of God and men. That's why Paul told Timothy, to instruct the rich to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. 
storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Pursue the things that last and learn to be content. Contentment. According to scripture, true wealth is not a matter of money or ministry success, but of contentment with God's provision for our needs. Contentment and joy stem from a relationship with God. No amount of money and no amount of success can produce contentment. God is the one that controls my circumstances, and he's promised to provide for the needs of you and me as his spiritual children. Um, God tells me I'm supposed to wait upon him for my daily provision. He assures me that he'll supply my clothing, my shelter, even during times of severe financial difficulties, he doesn't abandon us. He's teaching us to lean into him more completely, more severely. And hey, if you've walked with the Lord for very long, you've come through some time of severe financial trial. We all have. And that's how he shapes us. That's how he builds us. That's how he equips us for future ministry. My Bible says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory that are in Christ Jesus. This is a promise that we Christians can count on and we can bank on. Here's the problem that we face. The problem is that we often confuse our needs with our wants. Uh, this leads to what I call the if-only trap. If, if I only had this a new car, a bigger house, a better worship leader, uh, you know, a better outreach, a larger outreach budget. If I only had a new church building, if, if, I, if I had more room to, to minister to kids on Sunday morning, if I only had this, this, or this, then, then I, I, I'd be happy. Then I'd be content. But you know what? Contentment is not rooted in any of those things. It's rooted in the relationship I have with my Heavenly Daddy. My ability to go to Him, trust in Him, and receive from Him that which He's giving me. Um, we even spiritualize it by thinking that, that greater prosperity uh, would enhance our ministry. No. I remember, you know, being around pastors, and, 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 and if you listen really carefully, you could hear people uh, spiritualizing greed and, and lust, and because we might be looking at someone who had a larger ministry, and we wanted that. But no matter how much you spiritualize it, it's still, it was still a sin. My daddy used to say, if you hear somebody spiritualize, that's what they're doing. They're telling spiritual lies. So, so use that. Listen for that. Don't, don't be led into the temptation of greed or malcontentedness. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, I will, nor will I ever forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Philippians 4.11 says, um, Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul told Timothy, if we have food and covering, with these we need to be content. A calling is to be faithful stewards. Uh, desires need not be sinful unless they cause us to lose our gratitude for the things that God has placed at our disposal. So, nothing wrong with having money, 
what's wrong is when money has me. And as we go to our break in just a moment, I there gave you some exercises. I, I just encourage you to be very honest with yourself. Ex Self-examination is a must for those of us who long to become everything that God has designed us to be. I can't think of a greater accomplishment by the end of my life to become the man that God desires me to be. And for those of you students out there, to become the man or to become the woman that God longs to see you become, what a wonderful goal that is. We'll continue on after the break. God bless and uh, enjoy your break time.